The following is an edited recording from a live video broadcast. Image and audio quality may vary. Uh, myself and a whole bunch of dudes ran a convention uh, called Con 9 for Matter Space, and it was a one-off event. It was a weekend devoted solely to classic golden age cinema, movies, TV shows, and even radio plays uh, from back then. Uh, we had so obviously some people dressed in costumes. We had some displays and some robots and all the rest of it, So, which was absolutely fantastic. But the thing that we did, uh for the event um is that prior to the convention occurring we put the word out to all these people and we said okay name your top five sci-fi movies and we um got all those numbers together and we did a panel at the end of the convention discussing the top 20 right so this is what we're going to do tonight right so it's actually the top 20 classic uh sci-fi films just movies from before 1965 uh, top five, right? Now, this one is not from the 50s or the 60s. As I said, it was 1965 going backwards. So you're going to keep that in mind. And, of course, um, it had to be, and it had to be Metropolis, right? And there's now everything that needs to be said about this movie has been said from 1927. It is a silent movie, spectacular for its time, even though the Americans couldn't handle it and they cut, the, cut it to the shit out because it was like three hours long and all the rest of it. Um, you can now get really, really good copies of it. I think 2003 is probably the best version I've seen, the Kino version, uh, all been restored. They have actually found another version where they've added in stuff from Argentina. Uh, it's good, but it does make the thing longer than it needs to be. But Metropolis, uh, even by today's standards, is still spectacular. And, of course, there's that whole thing about uh, the class system, about the working class versus the uh, ar ar aristocracy aristocracy, if you will, the, the the guys at the management and all the rest of it, uh, about how one dominates the other. And, um, yeah, and, of course, you know, Metropolis is just one of those films that is really timeless. And believe it or not, it turns 100 years old in five years from now. It's like, how freaking trippy is that? So, uh, yeah, exactly right. The, the hits from Fritz, that's exactly what it is. So, yes, um, well done. So, yes, good old Metropolis. I was very, very happy to see this coming at number five. and uh, Well deserved as it should be. So, mm. Love it. Um, uh, yes, I did too, actually. Saw it at the Aston the Magnificent Restored Version 2000. Even I went to that. Bit. I didn't have a date. I went on my own. But, um, yeah, it's just beautiful. It was like it was filmed yesterday. The quality, the restoration was spectacular. And uh, as I said, that's the version I prefer to watch, uh, the 2003 Kino version. So there you go. All right. So there you go. Now let's move on. Top four. I've got some top four. Now we're going to start getting some nasty shit happening. Because we all love a lot when the aliens turn up and still decide to get a bit like a bit aggro, unnecessarily so, but they've got to do it anyway. And of course, it was invasion, was it in Earth versus the flying saucers? Yeah, baby. A bit of uh Ray Harryhausen special effects coming in, flying saucers coming in, blowing the shit out of everything. You can keep your independence day to yourself. This is where it all came from. So people of Earth attention, right? They're here, they're just taking over because they can. And this, of course, had some fantastic visual effects and they blow up the capitol building and when the ship crashes into the washington monument oh how awesome was this yeah baby i'm kind of, i'm with you mr Ange. fantastic so no explanation as to why they're here to take over they're just here to invade it's as simple as that and you gotta love it and um yeah these dudes sort of walking around doing their thing but it was just worth it purely for the visual effects um and uh ray harryhausen at his absolute prime uh, at this point. So there you go. Second favorite from Mr. Adzi. Awesome. Yep. You're right. Ray did his best work. And uh, this just put the guy on the map. Whenever you had a movie with Ray Harryhausen doing the effects, you just knew it was going to be top shit. And even by today's standards, it is still fantastic rewatch value. So absolutely love it. I'm just waiting for um, um, Elf to turn up saying he watched this three nights ago. So yeah, there we go. Yes. Mr. Glennis has said Ray Harryhausen is cool. So there you go. Get a bit of Harry Harry action. Got to love it. So, uh, yes, got to check it out if you haven't done so already. So, um, good stuff. People of Earth, attention. That's a voice coming to you from the outer world. All right, speaking of things invading the Earth, it is the theme, of course. You can't knock the original War of the Worlds, mate. The dudes from Mars, Mars come down and they go, you know what, we're not here to talk. We're not here to preach. We're just here to bloody shoot the shit out of everything and destroy everybody because that's what we're here to do. Uh, and good old the original uh, War of the Worlds. Um, now it's kind of funny. Uh, when I was at Elf's place recently, of course, Elf. Oh, here we go. Elf watched it last week, so there you go. How good, good is this? Um, there you go. And just regarding to uh, um, Earth versus the Flying Saucers, they did a good job adding color. I gotta admit, I'm not a colorization fan. Leave if it's meant to be in black and white, leave it in black and white. But uh, yeah, it's very, very good. So, uh, as Elf and I discussed when I was at his place. 
for those who don't know, because in the original War of the Worlds, there were tripods that attacked everybody, right? But you look at the machines and they clearly aren't tripods, but they actually do have tripod legs underneath there, like electrical things, because in the movie, they couldn't actually do the legs for real. They couldn't work out how to do it, right? So the thing isn't flying. It is actually walking on these three. You can see there's like static electricity type type things. That's the reason why they don't fly up into the sky. So uh, for those who ever wondered uh, what was the deal with the ships, but the ships look grouse and the sound effects have been used in all these other movies. And I just love it when the preacher walks up to the uh, to the Martian war machine and it just looks down with the eye and it says, stuff you, son, hit the turbos, gone. And it just like toasted puppy. And that was the end of that. Oh, you can't knock that. And then after that, it was on for young and old. Uh, and of course, everybody remembers the scene uh, we got the girl and got the, the three-eyed dude comes along, puts his arm on her shoulders like, oh, my God, how grouse was that? So, God, I love it. Uh, yes, I love this, although the musical is still your favourite, which is completely fine. Now, the musical was spectacular. Uh, I like this. War of the Worlds released the COVID. I yeah. <laughs> uh, love it. Amer always good to see the Americans get attacked by aliens. Yeah, exactly right. Love it. It oh, absolutely fantastic. So incredibly religious movie. Well, it does. It has that aspect of saying because the priest is trying to think of these guys have got a soul and they've got a religion and all the rest of it. And it's just it's like not the case at all. And you can interpret that in many different ways regarding an aggressor trying to, or, uh, uh, what do you call it, someone who's trying to make a peace deal with somebody who else is clearly an aggressor. Uh, not explaining it very well, but I know what I'm trying to say. So there you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> US is run by aliens. Absolutely fantastic. So, um, yeah, and you're right, many JR figures lost their lives. <laughs> well, that's right. A lot of really, really good visual effects. And you can imagine when the audience saw this movie originally, they'll be sitting there thinking, what's the deal, mate? You know, I mean, obviously, War of the Worlds kind of gives it away the fact that it, it's going to be a battle. But um, you can't sort of think, oh, how's this going to play out? What's going to happen and how's it going to work? And, of course, how are they going to win? And, of course, in the original story, it's the whole thing, the bacteria kills the aliens. And as I've discussed in another show, if it wasn't, if they just had their COVID shots, the aliens, uh, the Martians, they would have just won easily. So, but yeah, awesome movie, some great visual effects. And uh, I think who can, how can you knock a Martian war machine from that movie? That looks spectacular. So absolutely love it. Uh, Anne Robinson is still with us. She also guest out on the TV series, the same name, playing the same character. Well, as it turned out, uh, so the lady and the guy who in the movie, they both appear in the remake. Uh, they pay the grandparents of Tom Cruise's kids character that you see him right at the very end in the doorway uh, that's actually the original actor and the actress i can't think of their names and robinson is obviously one of them can't remember the guy's name but uh, there you go so that was a nice little homage to the original movie all right oh gene barry thank you yeah i'm shit ass with names so there you go oh yeah there you go we're both in the tom cruise movie right at the very very end in the distance which is particularly groovy all right we're down to the last two mm. so um yeah oh i like this one yeah even the stock footage yeah Americans had a lot of footage of um, uh, their military stuff, their planes flying around and their bombers, and they used them in these movies all the time, gave their cheap-ass movies a lot of credence, a lot of cred points, which is particularly groovy. All right, so we got down to the last two. It doesn't take much to work out which two is going to be. Don't anybody say Plan 9 from Outer Space because clearly that's not going to be the one or the Crawling Eye or any. I mean, what have I got written on here? Um, yes, man, the man from Planet X or the thing with x-ray not going to be any of that sort of shit and definitely not the wild women of wongo it's got to be the um uh one of the two movies uh ads said he prefers the tom cruise the tom cruise version i've got to say it's fantastic i love it but uh we're not here to talk about remakes we're talking about the original so all right so, <laughs> no doctor <laughs> the Daleks, you're freaking hell so yeah i agree rusky babes that's a whack in a half all right top two movies you can't knock them these were way above anything else and of course what was it going to be it was always going to be a toss-up between the two and the first one had to be Coming in at number two was Forbidden Planet. Um, the thing that I loved about Forbidden Planet, I think everybody did too, is the fact that it was set on a different planet. It wasn't actually set on Earth, uh, and it was particularly groovy. What I did find funny, though, uh, just sense of scale, you look at all the guys here, and you go, how would they fit them all in that ship just there, <laughs> flying around for a couple of years? It would get a bit squishy, don't you think? So um, there you go. Uh, yeah, what number two? Well, that was it. It was voted by the fans, Mr. Ange. Um, someone had to sort of take the someone had to take one for the team, and unfortunately, Forbidden Planet was number two. Um, but yeah, absolutely spectacular. I think everybody knows everything about this. Um, yeah, yeah, the monster from the Eden, Morbius, and of course, um, 
Pan Francis was spectacular. And, of course, Robbie the Robot, you know, in his first of two movie appearances, because the second one being The Invisible Boy. And uh, that's just the way it worked. And there's really hardly anything in fault about this movie at all. And I did actually really, really love it, as everybody else did too. But the idea of the invisible monster, I mean, how freaking scary is that? He goes into the ship and he's bending the steps as he's walking. He leaves his footprints in the dirt. Oh, mate. Nothing worse than invisible monsters, as we had with Fiend without a face earlier on. Invisible dudes tearing you apart. Yeah, that's not a pretty sight. So uh, uh, where were we? Uh, and should be number one. I hope you voted for it at Con 9 from Outer Space, but uh, clearly a lot of people voted for something else. Uh, yeah, nailed it. Your, it's your number one, which it is. That's fair enough, too. Oh, you can't knock them. You can split these two just like with, what do you call it, um, cigarette paper um, for those who smoke. Absolutely love it. Uh, you are right. Leslie Nielsen playing an actual serious character, which was particularly groovy. So, uh, and it does have that whole adage about saying that uh, regardless of how nice people are and with their pacifists and all this, deep inside there's that subprimal urge of human beings and it's always there. You can't hide it. And it goes right back to the caveman days. And that's what was particularly interesting. So he does the test, you know, in increases his, his uh, intelligence level, and of course, he's got a subprimal thing. And of course, the Krell had the same issue. So, uh, you can't, it's almost it's like the balance of the force scenario. You can't have the good without some bad, even if it's suppressed, it's got to always be there. And that's what Forbidden Planet was all about. But, uh, visually, though, yeah, you just couldn't knock it. It was just a spectacular movie. So, loved it. Uh, you are right. Easier, mon invisible monsters are easier to build for film. But as you remember the sound effects, and you see the footprints in the dirt, and of course it just walks past the guys, right? And remember, it goes through the uh, the energy beam. You don't really sort of really see it until later on. Uh, and you go, man, that's just creepy. As invisible dudes killing people, you can't say uh, that's not going to scare the shit out of you. Uh, Prince of the movie till now. Yes, you're right. The id monster. They did cut it out of the TV version. So whenever it's coming through the, the ray beams, they would just cut away and just show the guys. Uh, shooting at fresh air. You didn't really get to see it, which was a bit of a pity. It wasn't that scary, but I guess for TV at the time it was. Very, very good. Uh, Daniel has the 50th anniversary edition on DVD, and it looks grouse on a big screen because it's a cinemascope and the colour and all that. You really do feel like you're on an alien world, but, uh, yeah, can't say no to that. So, obviously, number one, I, you don't need me to explain who was going to be number one. This was my vote for number one. I still rate this as one of the best science fiction movies, if not the best science fiction movie ever made. Of course, the day the Earth was still. Had to be. Right, it's that old age. If a spaceship turns up to Earth, what happens? How do people deal with it? And of course, the entire story of this is based around um, it's a euphemism for the Russian invasion. Because obviously, in the 1950s, the big the, the communist threat was really, really big, it was really in America's face at the time. Um, and of course, Klaatu is the equivalent of a Russian invader, right? He's just He's there, he's there to destroy them, and he's, he needs to be destroyed himself. And, of course, that's not the case at all. And in, in the sequence when he's walking down the street with the um, with the briefcase and he's hearing all the radio reports and all the rest of it, they're saying, oh, we've got to find him, we've got to kill him, and all the rest of it. Where is he? He's hiding amongst us. Destroy him and all the rest of it. And it's just like and, – and, unfortunately, there would be people who think that way if this was to happen for real. And that's what I really liked about Dave Yeltsin stood still is the fact of saying, okay, how do people deal with this particular issue? And uh, I mean, you got the scientist um, Bernard who says, "Yep, the beauty. We want to sort of hear what this guy has to say, Clarkson, and why he's here, and all the rest of it." And you got other people saying, "No, no, he's got to be killed and destroyed and uh, annihilated from day one." And what made the movie an absolute winner was the fact that Helen Benson, her character, wasn't a scream queen, right? She dialed into what Clarkson was about. You know, it took a bit of convincing initially. Her other half, he was the prick. Remember, he gets the diamonds and he tries to sell them off and expose Clarkson for what he is. But Helen Benson's character was absolutely, that's the name of the character, was fantastic. And I really dialed into that. I worked really well. And even the sequence with the kid, right, Billy. Now, Billy, kids as a general rule in sci-fi movies are an absolute pain in the ass. But even he wasn't too bad. So, And, of course, they dealt with the whole thing of, you know, his father being killed in the Second World War and all the rest of it. So they had so much going for it. It was just magnificent. And, of course, Chuck in Gort. Mate, a monster, uh, a robot that can just destroy anything. Yeah, you can't knock it. So absolutely love it. But, yes, the paranoia of human beings. It's just the nature as it goes. So there you go. Uh, Gavin's with me on that one. Uh, absolutely agree. As I said, this wasn't my choice. This was voted by others. I picked number one for this, but I wasn't the only one. Uh, and you're right, Gort was so scary. And, of course, Gort was meant to be scary in the fact that he didn't speak. You know, and he can just destroy everything with his with his laser beam. Uh, absolutely, it was um, damn good stuff. Uh, oh, Angel's agreed with me now. Yep, got to give you on that one. As I said, you can take and build, split between the two. It really isn't. Uh, I think the difference was one vote. There was a one vote difference between the two. Uh, Chrissy said, "Yep, big Yahoo." That was her number one. Uh, 
Here we go. Yeah, we're not talking about remakes. Elf, we just move on and just stick with the original. You're right, they should never have done it. Uh, and you are right, Gavin, there is a link to Return of the Jedi 3 Alien standing side by side as Klaatu, Brada, and Nikto. It's ironic the movie that Con 9 was named for wasn't in the top 20. Well, all things being equal, Plan 9 for Matter Space is a, is a good, fun film, but it's certainly not the quality. And I don't even think it even rated a vote at the time uh, based on the list. If you do go to the Con 9 for Matter Space site, you have to go through my original site. There's a link there to go back to the Con 9 site. You can actually see what people voted. I mean, there wasn't a lot of votes for these things, but there were some. Uh, and unfortunately, Plan 9 uh, didn't kind of make it, which is a bit unfortunate. Um, one thing I do want to show you, now we're almost finished. Uh, for tonight. So that was number one. Absolutely fantastic. Hope you enjoy the countdown of the top 20, which is particularly groovy. One thing I did want to show you, if you do like uh, your classic sci-fi stuff and you do want to learn more about it, sure you can go on the internet. There's millions of websites, whatever. Uh, there's a really, really good book that got released called Keep Watching the Skies, uh, which is there. And I've got a nice, nice little cover of it just there from uh, Bill Warren, who was actually unbelievably famous at the time. It is... Um, as thick as they come. So there you go. This isn't something you can just sort of bedtime reading. Keep watching the skies. Covers off every single film uh, made in the 1950s. It's American movies only, so just keep that in mind. Um, and it's well worth checking out. So, yeah, keep watching the skies. Um, yeah, very, very groovy. And you can find out all the things you ever want to know about the movies that were made back in the day. Mm -hmm.